Hey guys, I'm sorry we're not able to meet in person. It would have been a great year for this for the 50th anniversary celebration for Florida Watercolor. But since we can't do that, at least we're able to do the streaming. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to share with you my painting technique and the story behind it, how I got here, as well as a demo that will show you kind of a cook show style, step-by-step, -step, how I start from a blank sheet of paper all the way to a finished product. I'm originally from Fort Lauderdale, but my husband is a diplomat with a foreign service. And so for the last 10 years, we have been living in Germany, DC, Italy, and most recently back in Fort Lauderdale because of COVID. A month ago, we were able to finally move to his post into New York City. So, so this is a view directly outside from the window of my studio. Uh, it's amazing and I can't wait to gain more inspiration from being in this city. Okay, so let's get started with this. Um, I take lots of photographs with my phone as probably everybody does these days and this particular picture I took while I was in New York City uh, three years ago when I unexpectedly had to make a trip from Italy to the US to deliver a painting that the Italian government would not allow me to take out of Italy because I could not prove that it was not his, an historical painting. So I rolled it up, stuck it in a tube, and booked a flight from Milan to New York City to get the paintings off to the Transparent Watercolor Society show. And while I was in the city for those couple of days, of course I did a big photo safari and found this particular area, uh, which oddly enough turned out to be just a couple of blocks away from where uh, I'm currently living. Uh, so I, anyhow, I start off with the, the photos in color. I convert it in Photoshop to black and white. And then I use one of the filters that called Posterize. Uh, with this particular uh, demo that I'm doing, I did the Posterize is, with five levels. And what that does then essentially is take that image and break it down into uh, five light groups. So here you have the white, and then the next lightest area is going to be essentially 25% gray, and then the next uh, darkest area is gonna be a 50% gray, which then would be 75% gray, and then 100% black here. So that makes it five distinct levels. I got started in doing this kind of painting Kind of in a roundabout way. I, I mean, I know that in the last five, five, six years, this type of posterized painting has become quite popular. I initially fell upon this when I was in Berlin back in 2012. But to get the image that I have gotten in Photoshop, I will then use a projector to project it onto the watercolor paper. Uh, it's not a big fancy projector because I don't really want to have those exact precise lines. And so what I use is a, a, a Pico projector. So it is this little teeny thing and that travels with me. Uh, and it doesn't do a fabulous job of projecting the image but it gives it the rough outline so I know the shapes. And the shapes is the part that I'm most interested in. And so what I wanna show you is how I take a piece of paper that is blank with nothing on it and just using the mouth atomizer to go from this to something like this. Um, and this is not the painting that I'll be demonstrating for you, but I just wanted you to see <clears throat> what kind of painting will be uh, the end result. So in this painting, you can see that it also has the same five levels going from white, then to a 25%, a 50%, a 75%, and then 100% for the darks.
So the main tool that I use to get these different colors, the blends, the textures, um, actually the method I deliver the pigment to the paper is using a mouth atomizer. Uh, there's several different kinds of mouth atomizers available. And the one that I use is a, a Pat Dews mouth atomizer. And I like this one specifically because it's fixed. There are a lot that are on the market that collapse back and forth. And I found that at times when I'm maneuvering and quickly trying to paint, this hinged area will move and it changes the effect. Coming from a background of internal medicine, I'm very much about control. Uh, I tend to think of it as just wanting to make sure of the outcome. Some people think I'm a control freak. You can take it either way. But this always provides the same result, and I know it's very predictable because the angle is not changing. Okay, so some of the other important tools that I use masking fluid or liquid frisket. And I only use this particular brand, PBO. I've found it to be the best for my needs. I know there's lots of brands out there and everybody has their favorite. But for me, this is what works best on the paper that I use. I, I use Arches, a 300 pound paper. Now with this drawing gum, there's two different types. There's this one, which will, you'll see it says caution irritant, which actually has an ammonia base to it. And there's another type that will be odorless. My experience with the odorless has been less than good and uh, I would not recommend it. It crumbles, this, one's, this product is made for use with children. Uh, the one that has the ammonia base, I find does the best job with the Arches paper and the paint that I use. Now I apply the drawing gum with these very inexpensive Cheap Joe's Ugly Brushes. They're $3 each approximately, and I can get uh, easily three or four paintings masked out of it with one brush. And then once one goes bad, I can trim it up and then use it for applying masking in a fine line. I use a very limited palette. Uh, it, again, it's about control and I can, I can control the outcome more easily with that. So the colors that I use are a Windsor Yellow, a Quinacridone Gold, a Permanent Rose, and a Windsor Blue Green Shade. Okay, so like most artists, I'm big into recycling and reuse and saving things. I mix my paint up with, with water and I store them actually in old pill bottles. Um, so this way I can keep a fresh supply of the liquid paint at hand. Now the part that I love the most about this is I've discovered the honey bottles that have these flip tops and have a rubber seal on them. And so what I do is after I mix up the paint again, they're all in a predetermined portion that I'll show you in a minute, I can screw this on top and I can then use my mouth atomizer through here. Pull it out, no paint wasted, none lost, no worries about spilling. Now I admit, sometimes I have to use a brush. I use a, a, just a giant wash three inch brush um, and you'll see that when I do the demo. But as far as for other brushes, I really don't use any uh, unless I'm doing finishing up work after the final stage where I need to do some corrections with that. So now I just want to show you how I go about mixing up the paint. This, this method allows me to always have the same measured amount of paint to use and it gives me predictability. So this is just an old, which when you buy coffee grounds and there's that metal tie across the top, that's all this is, just a bendable metal bar. I've marked off one inch here, and that way I'm able to just squirt out one inch of paint on here, drop that into the container, the recycled pill bottle container, and to that, then I'll just take water, and I then fill this container up halfway. So what this does is each time I have to remix paint, I know exactly how 
the concentration of, of the pigment to water ratio is going to be. And so if I run out mid painting, I don't have to worry about creating a stronger or weaker mixture when I have to go uh, to the, a, the next level with it. I've put on one of these rubberized honey recycled tops on here and I'll just give it a good shake. I do that for each of the colors when I start a new painting. That way I have fresh color each time. If I, again, by using that same mixture of the one inch to the half full bottle, if I have to use more pigment during the painting, I know exactly how much I'm dealing with. Okay, so let's get started with the fun stuff. Um, as I said, I, I work with Arches 300 pound uh, cold press paper. And so we've gone from there to the drawing already projected onto the paper. It's more like a contour drawing of the different shapes of the different values of zero, 25%, 50, 75, and 100% on the grayscale. And what I've done here is save the white highlights. So it's not just the whites, but this is the highlights of the whites. Um, and when you look at the original picture that I was working with, you don't see all these dots that I've put in here, the light bulbs of the sign, but I wanted to show those in there as a white highlight. And along here also some of these light bulbs that are also left as white highlights. Um, you'll notice that the white through here, along through here, is still not masked. So what my first step is after masking out the white highlights is to essentially tone the paper. And I will do that first off with a layer of water, then a light layer of color with the atomizer, but I'm only going to be using the yellow and the permanent rose, and then a layer of water on top of that to kind of wash the color through, and that will give me the toned paper to start with. All right, so now we're getting ready to do the, the first paint layer, and for those of you who've been paying attention, you might notice that there's a slight difference here. The, the plastic is coating over the work surface now. So this is just a drop cloth I got at a big box hardware store. Uh, uh, John calls this my Dexter phase because of that TV show where Dexter was always wrapping up all his bodies in plastic. Uh, I do this just to protect the area around because there's obviously some, some overspray. If I had been doing this in person, then we would have had uh, the first row of seats would have been in the splash zone Everybody had a little sheet of plastic to keep from getting overspray. So again, the first two colors I'm going to be using are just the yellow and the permanent rose. Mix those up again. And first off, starting with just spraying some water, just plain clear water onto the paper. <clears throat> and again, in order to make sure I've got a nice even layer of the water, this is where I'll use a brush just to smooth that out. And so once I've got this clear layer of water on, then I can go on to lightly add some color to the paper. Now, I have my drawing here at hand off to the side. You can't see it there, but this will give me some general idea about where I want my lightest lights and then some of the mid ranges. So what I'm doing is I've opened the top for the yellow, insert the atomizer in, and easily just blow. And so I put mostly the yellow area around where the lights are. After I pull the atomizer out of the container of pigment, then I just put that into the water and blow just to clear any of the pigment that remains in the atomizer out. So, and now I'm just going to do some of the permanent rows. So we're moving the atomizer again. As you can see, the color is slowly kind of mingling on through here. And <clears throat> I'll use the clear spray water 
to kind of move those around. And do some tilting with it as well. In this point, really all I'm doing is toning the paper. And the value that's going to be left on this, in, in our gray scale, if we look at the picture that we're working from, is going to be actually a value of zero. It's going to be the, theoretically the white. The stuff that is already masked out on this picture, that is all going to be just the white highlights. And there's going to be areas that don't have much color to it at all, and that's perfectly fine because, again, this is theoretically just going to be the zero value. So I'll just tip this up at an angle, allow the excess color to flow off the paper, wipe out underneath here so I don't get any bleed backs. Okay, so this will be the first sheet, the first color on it, and instead of forcing you to sit here and watch paint dry, I will go ahead and switch over then to the next phase that's already been prepared. So now we've got the very first layer, the zero percentage layers dried, and what I have already done is masked off the area that was white. So if we look in the drawing here, everything that was white has been masked. So, so it's only the 0% value that's been masked that you see here. Uh, you'll see underneath the dots of the white highlights that I had masked previously. And what I'm gonna do now is just mask this one area so you can just kind of see the technique that I use. And also to talk about what happens when you have two of the same values that come together, but yet you want to maintain that distinct shape. So as I talked about, the, I used the PBO, the drawing gum. <clears throat> I learned uh, from Linda Baker about storing this upside down because that then keeps the seal in there so you don't have to worry about it drying out as badly. And also when traveling, I will use a saran wrap or a sealer here to increase the security of it so there's less likelihood of it leaking. Um, also, I put it in a Ziploc bag to do the same. I use these Cheap Joe's Ugly Brushes and it's a very simple thing. I <clears throat> use basically an Hotel hand soap is one of the small mini bars that you get stored in a plastic container. You don't ever want to use a brush that's of any emotional value or a good working brush. Use just cheap old disposable brushes. And like I said, I'll get four or five paintings out of these out of out of a brush before it starts splaying out and is no longer usable in that shape. So I'm gonna pour out a little bit of the drawing gum here. This is an old bottle that I just used the top of as a reservoir. <clears throat> I go through about a bottle of this size about every six months. So I get a good use out of it. <clears throat> so in the clean brush, roll it around in the soap to get the bristles nice and coated with the soap. And then I just wipe off the edges here of it. So the part that I wanted to show about is this area where the, the A also coincides with another area of white, but yet I want to be able to tell that that same letter is still going through. So what I would do is mask this first area up to the line For anybody who likes doing puzzles, this particular technique is great for that kind of challenge because you're always having to look back on it and see, okay, wait a minute, what color goes where? Is this 
where I need to mask, does this get masked later? And you know, there's, there's lots of times when I come back and I find, oh crap, I totally forgot that area. Or <clears throat> you can always go back and lift paint. And if you find that you put masking down on a spot that you didn't want to have masked just yet, then that's easy to fix as well. Just make sure that the masking is totally dry and then just go back after a couple minutes and remove it. Now, after a while, you might notice that your brush starts getting gummed up and that just is a sign to go ahead and, and rinse it out again. Resoap re it and go back in with masking fluid. And you can see I'm just kind of following along on the drawing here so I know exactly where I want to have that value saved. And that's what, we're, what we really are doing right now at this point. <clears throat> we are just saving values. And this, what, this value that we're saving now is zero. It is the value of white, not the masked whites. These are the masked whites here, but now this is just going to be just the value zero. And I, I kind of find it easier for me to use these numerical breakdowns of the different values. If I call it a zero versus a 25, then I kind of know where that works out in the color scale on my drawing. Now, again, if you find that you do one of these little dots by mistake and it's not time, just let it dry and then you can go back and fill it in. And sometimes looking at the drawing, you'll see areas that, hmm, that maybe ought to be darker or lighter. And you can make your own artistic judgments on it. It's like, what point do you do this? So I'm just gonna go ahead and fill this in here while I'm waiting for this area to dry because that's gonna have the same value, but I want to maintain the shape. You know, I can feel that the brush is starting to get a little full with some of the frisket starting to dry. You want to avoid having the frisket go all the way up into the ferrule of the brush because that's when you will start having problems with it splaying out and getting stuck that way. It makes it harder to clean. So instead of dipping the brush all the way down into it and getting a full brush load, going back much more frequently seems to be more effective in maintaining your brush characteristics, its capabilities, its springiness for a longer time. So I'm just going back, rinsing it in the water, rolling it in the soap again, get all the bristles cleared up, <clears throat> using a paper towel, and that helps shape it as well. And now I'm going to go back in to where the two same value of whites would butt each other. But what I want to do is not touch that line. I'm going to leave a little bit of space. So just the slightest line. That way when the next layer of pigment goes on, it will create a delineation between the two shapes. And then you're able to then paint over that line in the next layer. Okay, so you can see how that's been filled in, but I'm still maintained that small line through there. And let me just check my drawing again, just to make sure I've got everything here. Nope, I still got to fill in some of this area on the B. <clears throat> I like the PBO because it's got a color to it. Um, there's some out on the market that have a pink color to them. I've seen some that have a yellowish color. Uh, but for this one, for me, I find it most easily uh, to discern which area is actually got masking on it versus a actual paint. And the nice thing about this particular part of the PBO is when you peel off the masking, as you'll see at the very end, it comes off frequently in big chunks of sheets, whereas the type that does not have the ammonia in it uh, comes off in pieces, in little small pieces that get all over the place and it's really super hard to clean up and to remove. 
Okay, so I think I got that little area done that I wanted to get finished here. So what we'll, what we'll do is just let this dry. Uh, that will take about five minutes and then we'll put on the our next layer of paint, which is going to be uh, the 25% value. This color here, again, theoretically is the white, the 0%. So now that we've got this masking fluid pretty much dry, um, I would, a couple things about drying masking fluid. Some people use a hair dryer and that works fine. Uh, just don't use the heat. Make sure it's just on cool air. Uh, you can set it by a fan to help speed up the drying or some people put it out in the sunlight or in a warm, warm area where the sun is. But be careful about that, about leaving it in the sun too long because it can melt the masking fluid into the paper. Um, you don't want to start using it, not letting it dry enough because it is water soluble. So if it hasn't formed the film on top of it and you add paint on top of there, then that's just going to dissolve the masking fluid. So I was talking a little bit earlier, alluded to how I got into doing this type, this style. And I'd gone on a street art tour in Berlin back in 2012 and I was just fascinated by the stenciling and I experimented with cutting out stencils and trying to use that in paintings um, and over time it just kind of evolved in going from one stencil just being you know black and white to trying layering stencils to get uh, a, a multi three-dimensional effect to it uh, to the point to where now I uh, am using this the, photo, the Photoshop and the posterizing to essentially create the stencil drawing and then using the masking fluid instead of, instead of cutting out a stencil and lying it on to the paper and then applying the spray paint, I use the masking fluid to create that stencil effect. So that's kind of how I got into it back in 2012 and have been using that kind of technique, that stencil effect, whether it's applied stencil that was a cutout or effectively creating a stencil by using the masking fluid on the paper uh, since then. Okay, so this looks like it's pretty well dried out. And again, where I am at with this is this is the toned paper, essentially white, zero value here with the that zero value masked off. Below it, you can still see the white highlights and I'm now going to apply a little bit of clear white, clear uh, water, and then I will use the pigments with the mouth atomizer in a very light uh, coating. So again, this is just trying to create a 25% value effect. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna wet the paper again, and I will use the wash brush to evenly distribute <clears throat> the water. So, so what's different between this stage and the one beforehand where I had the white paper, brush the water on, and then put the pigment on? Well, uh, if you might recall, at that point I tilted and moved and then poured the pigment off of the paper. This time I won't do that. I'll, I may tilt and manipulate the paper I'm just sopping up the extra water here, <clears throat> but I'm going to let the painting sit and the pigment will stay on the paper, so I'm not pouring any of it off. So this is the yellow. <clears throat> I'm again, shaking it up to get the pigment evenly dispersed. Using my drawing, I will look again where the areas where the lights are, then that I want to concentrate the lighter pigment there. So with the mouth atomizer, you can create a fine stream. The harder you blow, the finer the mist. I can create droplets by blowing very, very lightly with it. I don't know if you can see that on there. I'll show it in the pink, it will show up more. You can create texture also by intermittently blowing it. Well, like you're trying to play an instrument, like a clarinet. Do you see that droplets fly out? So that will give you some interesting texture through there. <clears throat> Again, clean the atomizer. That way you keep each of your bottles of pigment pure as possible. 
<clears throat> this is the permanent rose. Okay, hard blow, fine mist. You can see that not blowing nearly as hard, much more spatter looking effect. <clears throat> I can't emphasize how important it is to clean the atomizer between each color. I'm going to use a little bit of the blue, but only at the very end because this blue, this thalo blue is so darn strong, <clears throat> it will overtake the painting very quickly. So I'm just going to kind of look here again, assess where I want some more color. And you can see when I'm adding the yellow on top of the permanent rose, it's creating a nice orange effect there. Okay, once again, clean out the atomizer. And if you see there's paint on the exterior, just dunk the atomizer in the water. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to use just a little bit of the cobalt, not the cobalt, this is the phthalo, excuse me. Um, and realizing that if I put it up onto the yellow, it's gonna give it some green. If I put it against the permanent rose, I'm gonna see purple. And where I have the orange and this blue going in, it's going to kind of gray it down. Again, just going very, very lightly with the blue. Clean up the atomizer. <clears throat> and now just kind of let it sit blend do its thing so this layer that's on here now this is a 25 percent value and you can see there's some very interesting texture showing up in here along where the permanent rose is meeting with the phthalo blue there are dots of the permanent rose in the yellow that have not created an orange there are areas of just the phthalo blue here against the yellow making kind of a green hue um, i go back around where I see these areas starting to puddle with paper towel and just sop, and sop that up a little bit. You'll see that it will fill back in with more pigment too as it dries. So if I, if I have an area that's just pretty like flat with the color and not very interesting, um, I can go back in with water, just plain water, and use that to create some texture. So first I need to oh, find a container for water. And I'm just, this is just a clear container. I'll pour a little water in there. So as this dries a little bit, and you can see the sheen on the side is gone, that will give you a, more of a droplet effect where you see the pigment disperse. Let's see, that probably's not dried enough. And you'll see areas like up here in the corner where the water earlier on that was clear did not saturate the paper enough so the water color is not blended in. So I can go ahead and add some more water here to get that area of paint flowing. Or I can just leave it as it is, which will create an interesting texture as well. Okay, so you might have noticed uh, a change in the lighting here. It's now afternoon and I've got sun that's coming in uh, directly to the side. So the blinds are down a bit and that might affect the, the, the perception of the colors on here. Um, what has changed also in is that the picture here now is at the 25% area is painted, just to refresh on that. And I've masked off the areas that I want to save at that 25% stage. So we'll now go through and put on the 50% color. So everything that's not masked here will be covered over with 50% uh, of the paint at that intensity. 
And you notice some areas too that have uh, not gotten exact same coverage. The uh, areas that were a little bit dried from when I put the paint on here and did not go through. And these you don't need to worry about because they'll be covered over when we do the next layer of paint and you, you won't see that. It'll, it'll add some interesting texture to the background. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the spraying here. It is going to be all four colors this time around. I'll be starting off with the yellow. Now also always clean off afterwards. This time I'm adding in the quinacridone gold that was not used previously. The, as the yellow can only really get about a 40% value, this is why I'm adding in the quin gold now and then in the next time we won't be using any yellow at all. And each time, be sure and swirl the pigment mixture around too, because some may have settled since you've last used it. And now for the permanent rose. And you notice some wonderful texture happening here too. And the last is the blue going again, just very minimally with that, since it's such a strong color and can take over. It's easier to go back and add more later if you need it. It's really hard to take it away since the stale of blue is a permanent staining color. Always remember to clean out the <clears throat> atomizer after using it. And so I'm kind of I'm kind of happy with what's going on here. I might add a little bit of water. That way it will mix up these droplets so it's a little bit less texturized. This is just clear water. Okay, I think that looks good. I'm gonna just let that set, percolate for a bit, and then go on to the next step. So what we've done here is added the 50% layer of color, and it was all four colors, the yellow, quin gold, permanent rose, and phthalo blue. And then we'll go on just to the next step. We have the painting at the point where 50% of the painting value is down. Uh, we've masked the 0, the 25, and we've masked the 50, and that part here can be seen in a different coloration. So this is all the 50% masking that's been done. Uh, you can see here the 25 and then also the 0 and also barely can you see the dots that represent the white 0 highlights. Now after these repeated applications of the pigment, you also notice that the lines start getting a little hard to see, and especially in darkened areas through here. So what I often do is go back and redraw the lines in the dark area <clears throat> so that I can see when it comes down time to mask in at the 75% stage where the masking goes and where it doesn't. Um, and, and these lines, too, as you trace them back again for the, the second time around, they're going to be a little bit off, a little bit different. They tend to be not as uh, fine. 
And I think that really adds to the feeling of the painting, uh, gives it a, a more, not to say abstract feel, but not so exactly literal feel to it. And so with the, this next layer of paint application, again, keeping in mind that we're looking for the radiant glow, the lighting on the underhood here of the signage. Um, so I keep the warm areas through there. Uh, also, at this point, I won't be using the yellow. I'll only be using the quinacridone gold, the permanent rose, and the phthalo blue. So always remember to shake it up again in case anything has <clears throat> deposited on there and settled to the bottom. Okay, so that was the layer of the quinacridone gold. Next, I'm going to do the permanent rose. Okay, well, I love this whole fire bright color coming through here. And finally, the last color I'll put in now is the phthalo blue. And this is going to be a little bit darker this time, a little bit more blue. And there's a little area that's dark here that you see that's also in the drawing, so I'm going to add some blue to that. Okay, so let, let's let this go ahead and dry, uh, and we'll move on to the next level. Now we're at the final painting stage, and this is when you put in your darkest darts. So what's happened here now is we've got this paint that you see here peeking through, that is the paint that's at the 75% value. We've gone and highlighted all of the areas we want to save that are at the 75% value. So everything you see peeking through is going to be painted over at 100%. So you're looking at the reference drawing, for example, this area through here, you can see this is the 75% value. Here's the 100%, and that's been un, that's not masked, the 100%. The 75% is masked to save the, that value. So everything that's we want to save that's at the 75% value at this stage, we've already masked off here, and that's this new additional mask. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with this final layer. And, it, and here I will use, again, the uh, quinacridone gold, permanent rose, and the phthalo blue. Now I'm just going to start off with the permanent rose, then go to the phthalo blue, and then I'll add in quin gold. That will give you those that triad together will then really darken it up. And always remember to clean out between colors. And now the phthalo blue. Okay, and finally I'll add the Quinn Gold. And there's lots of little spots that are left open that needed to be done at 100% value, but you may not necessarily get it so perfectly done with the sprayer. And at this point, I will go back with a big wash brush to make sure all those small little nooks and crannies are indeed colored in.
Now you can see like this area has gotten more green than I think that I want. So to counterbalance that green, I'm going to use their permanent rose. And you can see how that darkens it right up. So I'm gonna let this sit for a minute. Um, it, the colors kind of mingle and merge together. It just gives some beautiful shading to the painting. But again, this is the darkest darks. And I want to be able to make sure that all the areas that needed to be <clears throat> uh, filled in with the darkest darks. I see some spots over here that did not get painted in, that they are indeed also covered. So I'm gonna use this big three inch wash brush. And you see how okay, that just fills it right in there. <clears throat> this won't disturb the first layer of color of this at the 100% that I put on, so what areas that were more red will stay that way. Um, it will darken some spots, <clears throat> but it'll give a nice mixture of color with it. You notice I'm also picking up the excess paint <clears throat> with from the brush into a paper towel here, because there's a lot of pigment floating on here now. Just want to make sure you get all the spots that need to have that 100% value filled in. <clears throat> okay, so also at this stage, if you want, and uh, I feel that you can go through with paper towel and blot up areas. So like this area through here is all entirely done with the masking fluid. So there's no painted area through here, so that will help get up some of this excess paint. So when I go through and start removing the masking fluid, I don't have to worry about contaminating the areas underneath by some rogue paint. Um, it's usually not a problem, but if you got the time to do it, why not get some of that extra possible paint staining the paper off there? And also on the edges, you want to mop up around there just so you don't get any water going back under, back filling it, causing a blossom through there. Oh, there's some beautiful darks showing up here now. Okay, so there we are with all the paint applied that's going to get applied now you just sit back and wait and make sure everything is totally bone dry before you proceed on to the next step we've arrived to the final part the removing of the masking and uh, to me this is always like christmas time you get to open a present because you never know exactly what you're going to have so i've already removed all of this area of the painting and i've covered it up so there'll be a big surprise at the end but i'm going to show you how i go about taking off the masking I use this, it's a rubber cement pickup. Um, and it's very similar to the material that we used to be on like on crepe sold shoes. So when I do the masking removal, I always work from the center part away towards the edges. And you can start just by taking it and dragging it down. And I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this, but you can see how it, pulls up little strips of the masking material through here. And as it does that, you don't, you don't want to really push hard because it gets a lot of traction with this rubber cement pickup and it will start pulling it out automatically uh, and, and little rivulets. And so I mentioned before that there were two types of this PBO masking fluid and see how this is coming off in little cords that seem to attach to each other and pull off. Now you can just pull this straight off. The other kind, the stuff that's not ammonia based, just falls into little teeny pieces like this and does not stick to each other. So it's, I find it much harder to remove and I don't see it, any benefit into the end result of the painting. <clears throat> so
So again, just kind of starting in the center, pulling across. And after you've gone through lots of layers of adding on this frisking fluid, especially in spots where you don't have many darks, it will be super easy to pull up in sheets. You know, the first time I ever used an atomizer was when I took a John Solomon workshop back in the early 2000s and bought it for the workshop, used it some, and enjoyed doing what you did with it in the workshop and then kind of put it back into my tool chest of art supplies and never really used touched it again for a decade uh, not until i became enthralled with the urban art the street art where they were using stencils for doing their paintings and when i started thinking about how could i apply the that same kind of methodology to watercolor that's when it occurred like oh yeah that i have this really cool tool that will turn the watercolor into a paint mist, just like the spray cans that the street artists used for their stencils. So when I dug that out and gave it a try with stencils that I made, I found that it worked pretty well. The problem was with the stencils, you got a lot of underspray on the edges. So I couldn't get these crisp, clean edges that the street artists were able to do. And then I started <clears throat> thinking about how could I obtain that, and it occurred to me that I, because I had done a workshop with Linda Baker where we used a lot of masking fluid and doing layers, that this was a way to fix that issue of having to cut out your stencil by just creating the stencil directly on the paper. So I think I've got most of the masking fluid off. You can rub your hand across, and you'll feel rough spots where it drags your hand. You can feel the, the texture change and you know that there's some more of the masking fluid there. And you can peel that off. <clears throat> After a while you don't even need to look for it. You can just read the paper with your fingers and find all the extra little pieces that are hard to tell because they're in dark areas. Okay, so one more piece there. I think that's pretty much got everything. So, let's go ahead and peel this back so we have the big reveal. I'm gonna rotate it around so it'll be the proper orientation that we've had all along. And so here's the finished painting. Well, it's not quite finished. I should say the painting with all the masking removed. There's always little areas that need touching up once you get all the masking off and you can stand back and look at it. But you can see the effects that I was talking about with the whites, highlights that were left through here within the, the light bulbs themselves. And then here's what would have been white, the zero percentage. Then you move on to what the 25%, 50%, 75% here, and then the 100%, the darks. Um, Typically, a painting like this on a half sheet takes 25, 30 hours total to do. So it's a good book on tape kind of activity. Um, it can be very meditative for you. Oh, things I want to point out. the When we first did the masking on that white, the 0%, we did an area here so you could see that the A still went across and did not get confused with this part of the B. And you see that still there's that fine line that keeps that shape delinified. Um, there might be some stray pencil marks in, throughout here that you can still see. You can easily remove those with an eraser. And if there's spots that you think need to be touched up, all you've got to do is go back in and add some more color. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I've always found these interesting. Uh, I will have to say that throughout doing these paintings, in the last couple of years, I found a common theme, and it's always been bar. Um, and, and when I first moved to Italy, it was interesting because the, this word bar was, in my mind, thinking, oh, wow, these people drink a lot. I'm going to love this country. But in reality, it's just where you go get coffee. So this is an interesting take on it here in, from New York City, where it's the bar sign, but just 
a little bit in reverse, reflecting that it's not exactly what you think it is. One of the things I talked earlier about was using just a limited palette and how that really makes it easier to have a painting where the colors harmonize. Um, so I've got a couple other examples here as well to show you. These all are using the exact same palette. And this painting done of a scene from Mumbai also is the exact same palette. The same four colors used keeps the painting harmonious as does in this painting from Venice. Again, the same four colors. So as I had mentioned earlier about all the colors that I used in this limited palette, the yellow, permanent rose, quinacridone gold, and phthalo blue, lend themselves to make a more harmonious painting because it's only just this, these few colors, but yet you can get an entirely different feel uh, with depending on how much of what color you use where. So this painting of a tram car in uh, Milan was done using the exact same palette. Okay, so we're all finished with the painting. I'm uh, really glad that it turned out all right. I was a little worried beforehand because you just never know what the final reveal is going to be. Uh, I hope you found this entertaining and somewhat enjoyable, maybe even learned something new that you could apply for your creative process.